Hello and welcome to News Trash here on the Gig Show, the inquisitive otter of video game news programs. I can't think of good intros, so I just think of the first thing that comes to my head. I am Rob, and as ever, I've been joined by producer Rob. Hello there. Hello, and there is nothing wrong with otters. There is an entire channel dedicated to otters as pets. Well, there's more than one. There's two. There's Katsumet and Itty Atty. I have no decision on which one is my favourite, because they're both adorable. I like Katsumet because one of the... Uh, I think it's uh, Kataru is the... The otter, when he's eating cat food, he'll eat one in his mouth and then he'll dump the next one in water and then eat it out of the water and then he'll eat the next one out and eat straight into yeah. his mouth. You know, otters are wonderful creatures. Uh, yeah, Katara's got weird eating. Uh, seeing him eating salmon is just, like, it's amazing. Just the pauses yeah. he strikes. As bad as video game YouTube is, <laughs> as bad, bad as movie criticism YouTube is, or... Influencer, YouTuber is, or literally political YouTube. Any YouTube you could possibly imagine is poisonous and is noxious and is foul and is aggressive and is horrible and as racist as all of that is. Animal YouTube is the most wholesome thing. Oh, God, yeah. But, seeing as though we're not on wholesome YouTube, we're on awful YouTube, I think we just better crack right on with... Because, you know, let's be fair, it's video games, we're talking about video games. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or listen on podcast providers, thank you. Uh, support us in whatever way you can, we'll have details that later. But, let's be honest, most video game news recently, besides announcements, has been kind of awful. Yeah. We're going to start off with uh, Sony and their PlayStation Investor Relations document, which it made for interesting reading. Obviously, we know that the PlayStation 5 is the best-selling Sony console uh, so far, you know, from launch. It sold, like, 7.8 million. I don't know um, how it's managed that when other consoles are much more readily available. There's some sort of witchcraft at play here. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know... How it can be co- so hard to get hold of. Yeah. But for the best-selling. I don't exactly. understand that. <laughs> you know, for, for the financial year ending March 2021, they'd sold 7.8 million units. And according to the relations document, they you know it's sold at a loss. Now, we were kind of aware of this already. But in context, the PlayStation 4 sold 7.6 million in the same time frame. PlayStation 3 sold 3.6 million. And the PlayStation 2 sold 1.4 million. And PlayStation 1, in the same time frame, only sold 700,000 units. Yeah, just on, uh, sort of to saddle on the back of that, um, yeah. those numbers jump up exponentially, generation on generation. Yeah. And there's one thing, there's one slide in the presentation that they've... I don't know if they made public or it's been made public by press outlets, but one slide in particular said the share of female gamers... The share of female gamers, I think, has gone up to 41% in the last financial year. Yep. Which, despite all those people who are territorial gatekeepers about gaming, I think that is fantastic. Yeah. It's a broad open church and everybody's welcome. And the fact that sales figures like this back it up, that's just good. That's just yeah. good for the industry. There are some interesting uh, aspects of the document that uh, I, I, you know, I do want to touch on. But uh, one thing that I will... Uh, say with regards to the sales figures of the consoles um, just to kind of put this into a greater uh, context PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3 the market for video games year on year and generation on generation was much smaller in the PlayStation 1 era and in the PlayStation 2 era and it was predominantly male gamers Yes. We know that. That's a historical fact. You know, that's already well documented. We already know this. Um, from the PlayStation 3 onwards, the market starts expanding. Well, they are the yeah. mainstream industry now. They are the most mainstream industry. And anybody exactly. who tries to suggest differently doesn't know what they're talking about. Exactly. So, yes, I think it's only natural that there are more female gamers now. I think that is a that is a healthy reflection of the industry, I would say. Mm. Getting rid of this gamer bro mentality that yes, games are for men and boys, I think can only be a good thing when that's sort of thrown in the history bins. Yeah. Good. Where it falls down a little bit, I fail, is when it when you look at the retention by age. Um, they're saying that PlayStation 1 gamers have stuck with us in one of their slides, 
and it show, but it shows this massive fall off after you hit kind of late thirties and onwards, where the you know the the trend is massively down, uh, and that to me is kind of a reflection of just companies in general. How there seems to be a common thing within companies in general where they they would rather have new people in than cater to their existing customers yeah i don't think it's going to be the same with my generation the ones mm. who are like who discovered gaming through the playstation one effectively i mean i played stuff before it but playstation one was the generation where i was like whoa what's this this is amazing yeah. i'm i'm on this ship i'm on this boat for good now but this generation my generation i think it won't be the same because it's a much more normalized industry yeah whereas people who are a bit older than me it isn't yeah but yeah, there's interesting aspects of this report. Uh, the one fifty percent of the market share for the console space, which I think is ambitious. The PlayStation yeah. Four had forty-five, so it's not unreasonable. I think they could increase it, but that's forty-five percent when the industry was basically made up of Sony, who were on their air game, Nintendo, who were crazy on their air game, and Microsoft, who were drunk at the wheel. Now, Microsoft yeah. aren't drunk at the wheel anymore. They've woke up and they've had the DUI and they've gone through the, the training that they get put yeah. on by the <laughs> AA. And now they're a properly functional member of society and a proper driver on the road, a responsible and safe driver. Well, I don't know where this analogy is going, but I'm going to continue with it. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but yes, it's a competitive, fully realised market. So I think that 50 is very, very... Com- like, it's a bit too pie in the sky i can understand how they come to that conclusion but evidence of what the industry is now i don't think it'll be able to be backed up that one but anyway i mean it's an interesting bit of reading for sony uh, it's nice yeah. that they're acknowledged that returnal has been a successful uh, yes. new ip which i think is great it's a great nod for housemark and nobody said this but i do think that sony will snap them up and make them ex- an exclusive party maybe yeah. after one or two more games so I- We'll see. They might not even wait that long. They might it might be earlier than that. Some of the other interesting bits from this was the uh, PlayStation Plus. Uh, the number of people on PlayStation Plus forty eight million. That's a lot of people. Yeah, that's that's a lot of income just from PlayStation Plus as well. Majority of those people are using PlayStation Plus for multiplayer with the free to play game with, with the free games as a secondary thing. Uh, in terms of their uh, future development plans, um, Sony have indicated that they do want to start developing in markets that are outside of their usual stomping grounds, so places like South America, Africa, uh, the majority of Asia, and Russia. They put those as future development prospects. The investor document did make clear that they've been thinking, you know, Jim Ryan did say that they've been thinking about how players enjoy their content, and they've had some early access, early success experimenting with mobile games and apps, and it's just one of the avenues that they're exploring to reach millions of gamers beyond their platforms, which is good. You know, it shows that they're aware of changing gamer trends and changing habits, and they're looking to capitalize on them. So that's good. Um, so, yeah, moving on. Yeah, uh, EA. EA have released oh, their... what have those tykes <laughs> been up to this time? EA's released some of their financials, and they make for interesting reading. Um... Apparently, EA made uh, around $1.6 billion, a little bit over $1.6 billion, because of Ultimate Team. From Any the internet- game to make that much off one mod, that's kind of ew. Yeah. Well, let's put it this way. That's in From their financial report that they've released, right, that's 29% of all the money that EA brought in in one year was from Ultimate Team alone. Refer to previous answer... Yeah, Ew. but and a lot of people will rightly focus on the fact that Ultimate Team is bringing in that massive amount of revenue. But one of the bits of the financial report that uh, that stuck out for me personally was that EA, their cumulative tax pre-tax profits since the year to, since the fiscal year of two thousand and seven was six point zero two billion. Yeah, yeah, that covers the period of time since EA, Ultimate Team mods were first introduced. During that same period of time, EA's cumulative estimated income tax expense for the same period of time was minus six hundred and seventy-five million. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> so instead of paying tax, 
Somebody's given them 600 million, <laughs> See, effectively. Yeah, it makes for an effective tax rate of minus 11%. Now, in America, the corporate tax rate is th- was 35%, but it's been dropped down to 21% since 2017. But it does raise a lot of questions that EA are effectively only, uh, you know, only uh, having a tax rate of 19%, which is below what America expects its corporations to pay as a rule in general. Here's the thing, right? Governments and big businesses, I don't know if you've heard this, listeners, this might be a revelation to you, or the sarcasm might really be hitting. I don't know. But either way, big businesses, teeny weeny bit corrupt. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, at at this moment in time, right, and, and over the past five years, there are eight taxing agencies in uh, in eight different countries that are examining EA's returns. That's the US, Italy, Spain, the UK, Germany, Sweden, India and France. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of skeevy, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, this is an industry where um, they've been able to get away with it through all sorts of jiggling IPs and stuff like that. Activision Blizzard managed to, you know, they, they were hauled over the coals because they basically used uh, international IP juggling to send billions to their subsidiaries in tax havens. Rockstar North went a full decade without paying any corporate tax, even though during that decade they made Grand Theft Auto V the biggest selling game of all time. And to have GTA Online, which is basically like a unending well of cash. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't know... This is the sort of thing where you think, why am I even bothering with games with these companies? Because they're just genuinely kind of skeevy and evil. Trying to do everything they can out of getting to pay their bills. But when it comes to you, they will fleece you clean in a heartbeat. So that's why I never played Red Dead Redemption, because I think that company, I don't care anymore. Honestly. You want to play the? You want to play this game? Give us your blood. Give us your muscles. Give us. Give us the entirety of your body. Are you using that skeleton? No, we'll take that as I, well. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I played an Activision Blizzard game. I can't. I can't at all. Not in the slightest. Just the year. The year are heading that way. They're genuinely just, heading that way too. I just don't want anything to do with these companies. And the more people do that, the better it is for the gaming industry because that is acting through. Well, it's your opinion through your actions it's not like ah yeah i don't like this company but i'm still going to buy the games yeah if you don't like the company don't yeah. support them absolutely speaking of big companies with dodgy taxes amazon oh those <laughs> lovable takes what are they up to did you see how i did the same thing there because it's exactly <laughs> the same story well not the well, same story but, it's you know. not right you know amazon have that new world mmo that's supposed to come out in august this year oh they've actually put a release date to that yeah, it's supposed to come out in August. Supposed to. Hmm. So, Amazon were doing some alpha testing or beta testing. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, alpha testing, I think it was. And they basically had an in-game storefront. And the in-game, the in-game storefront raised a few eyebrows for some of the things that were in the in-game storefront that you had to pay cash for, like, not in-game cash, but actual hard currency. Things like fast travel. Yeah, there was a bit of a backlash to this, and they had their usual... The, the, the social media reaction, I haven't got it in front of me, but it, it kind of utterly inept, and they were torn over the... Like, dragged over the coals, ass first for it. Yeah. Uh, I think essentially it was... It's to make the game easier for those who don't have the time to dedicate to it. And this, this Twitter response was, really, in 2021, that's what you're trying to say? Yeah. Come on. We know what you're doing. Yeah. And then the, the the social media guy kept on digging and digging and digging and digging. Yep. And it, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was an awful, awful response. But isn't it strange how Amazon got hauled over the coals for uh, having to pay money for fast travel, basically putting fast travel behind a paywall? Mm-hmm. Yet Nintendo kind of got a pass. Well, that just says a lot about video gaming culture, how... Uh, yeah, Nintendo fans are very, 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 very defensive of the fact of anything Nintendo do, despite Nintendo acting and having some really, really, really weird corporate strategies. Yeah. I mean, Skyward Sword HD, right? 
I I wasn't a big fan of the original Skyward Sword when it came out. I thought the controls were really, really janky. Well, you weren't alone. I mean, it's one of the more disliked in yeah. Zelda history. But the, the thing about Skyward Sword, they basically said, okay, you can fast travel in this game as long as you buy the Zelda and Loftwing amiibo, which basically means that, I mean, that's a paywall. It's not just a paywall. It's a pair wall that's going to sell out really, really quickly because those Amiibos are like crack to Nintendo fans. As soon as they hit the star shelves, they're gone. Yeah, which means the it's a pair wall that's only going to increase in the amount you have to pay for it. Yeah, and Nintendo will be aware of how popular their Amiibos are, otherwise they still won't be selling them. Yeah. I don't know whether Amazon's approach to it or Nintendo's approach to it is kind of is the more disheartening. The lesser evil is Amazon, but both evil. It's just, we just started off with lots of evil. We started off with some positive Sony news, but then it just descended into a den of evil. So let's go back to some some more heartening okay. news. Evil is a strong word, but it's an accurate word too. <laughs> <laughs> So, more hearty news, more, more, more news that's good for the soul. Time Splitters, Free Radical, of basic, the original <laughs> founders of Free Radical, have reformed. Yeah, I mean, I've got issues with this news story. I mean, on the face of it, I can't be happier that Time Splitters is back. Yeah. Because it's it kind of pre fortnite Fortnite. I don't think there'd have been a Fortnite without Time Splitters, because this is a game where you're effectively playing as cartoon characters, people out of time, all sorts of wacky well characters in a multiplayer shooter which times time splitters was kind of the first hero shooter wasn't it in a way yeah yeah i mean it, before you had stuff like team fortress and fortnite and all sorts of stuff like that there was time splitters it, yeah it was a fantastic game yeah really happy that free radical especially are reforming to bring it back because they were the company which you know, formed it, and they were the company which got what that was. And I think they yeah. were bought by Crisis, and then they just sort of vanished into the ether. Yeah. My issue here is they've announced it way too early. I think it would have been an amazing... Uh, and here's one more thing for like a press conference, mm. where they just say, like, hey, out of the blue, drop a trailer for uh, Time Splitters. And like people who grew up in sort of early... Well, playing games in the early 90s will just sort of have a collective pant loosening, much in the same way that, you know, uh, Shenmue 3 did when that was uh, trailed at Sony's E3. Yeah. Much in this, like, a, a Skate have done it the same way as well. They've announced it way too early. It'd be better when this stuff just comes out of the balloon. It's like, oh my god, this is so cool. Yeah. Second yeah, point. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. This is going to be a very hard sell because the people, um, young people don't know what Time Splitters is and selling it to that audience is going to be an uphill battle. Yeah. Do you know the weird thing? I think Time Splitters is one of those games where if they bring it back, don't just bring it back on one platform, open it up to... All, basically, take on the likes of Fortnite. I don't think they can. It's too much I, of a titan. I think uh, no, I don't think they can, but then again, you know, Call of Duty Warzone managed to uh, take a good portion of the audience, didn't it? Make it, uh, make it what it was in the time that it was out. In the time it was out, it was an antidote to Call of Duty and brown military shooters and grey military shooters. So what need, what is the antidote to... What is the formula there in the modern shooter that needs an antidote to it, if you get me? There's something yeah. which is too much of, so Time Splitters always was better when it was zagging to what... When the industry was zigging. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah you've got a good point there. Um, I mean, it's difficult now because you've got stuff like Fortnite and Overwatch and all these other hero shooters that are around, so... Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. like I said, it goes back to the point of I think they've announced this too soon. I think they yeah. just should have announced that they've re- reformed Free Radical and left it I, at that and let people's I, imagination do that. I think one of the things that I always loved about Time Splitters was the was kind of the uh, the humour of it. Yeah, yeah. And I think if they manage to retain that at least, then that's something Definitely. to build on. And also, one of the things, I think I mentioned it before on some of our shows, that if it's multiplayer, everybody's banned from using the monkey because... He's below everybody yeah. else's eyeline, so it's an automatic win if you're the monkey. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> Don't remind me. The monkey is cheating. <laughs> anyway, moving on to uh, Valve. And they are reportedly making a 
handheld Steam PC. Which I've seen the designs of it, and it kind of looks like a Switch, but a bit bigger and without yep. the removable bits. Now, um, this is uh, according to a uh, news report by Ars Technica, which is... All right, sorry, bro. I... <laughs> All right. I know where you're going. <laughs> Put your grown-up head on for a minute. <laughs> sorry, I, lo- I, I love their name. I know what it means, but I, I just love the name. Multiple sources familiar with the matter have uh, apparently confirmed speculation that Valve are preparing a Switch-like handheld PC alternately alternately referred to as Neptune or Steam Pal. Now, a little bit of video games history for people who don't actually know, and most people probably don't. I think calling it Steam Pal is fine, but I would hesitate to call it Neptune because Neptune was what was one of the code names for an ultimately failed idea from Sega to merge the Sega Genesis with the 32X and produce a new console. Hmm. Yeah, that's eventually quite the nation. No. Yeah, eventually the way they decided to go completely to the left and go with the Sega Saturn, which <laughs> wasn't exactly a success either. Yeah, I mean this is this could be a bit of a game changer for PC gaming because there's always this stigma with PC gaming that it's effectively an addiction to buying new kit every so often, whereas this kind of circumvents a lot of that and it's just sort of a one size fits all but the question has to be asked then of the really system intensive games how will that sort of scale yeah i mean there's that but the fact is that the handheld pc market is already pretty well established um so okay. steam uh, steam aren't really jumping into a new market i mean you have companies like uh, gpd who have been producing handheld pcs for years now and you have uh, a new one that's coming out called the aya neo which is it looks like a switch it's you know there's design uh there's design but elements that are clearly from the switch yeah the the living and dying of this idea is the price point yeah um that will be the ultimate thing but given how much the steam controller cost how much it's like 50 quid for the controller or 60 quid for the controller it's quite expensive yeah yeah um, and given how much the Steam controller actually cost, I would say that this probably isn't going to be cheap. That's where it lives and dies, ultimately, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. It's a cool idea, and it would actually get me invested in online, well, uh, PC gaming a little bit more. Yeah, but I mean, uh, it, yeah, I, price. I've tried I've tried some of the handheld PCs, I've tried the GPD stuff, and they're impressive machines for what you have. You know, it, it literally is a gaming PC in the palm of your hand. Yeah. But, you know, um, there's the screen size to take into account and various things like that. The Iron Neo, I haven't actually managed to get my hands on uh, get my hands on one to try yet, but uh, I've heard very good things about it. Anyway, 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 that's your uh, main news. Now for some uh, quicker stories. Square Enix seem to be making a thing of going down a darker route with uh, their newer games, because Dragon Quest XII apparently is going to be much darker than their previous offerings. Which isn't saying much, because, you know, uh, Dragon Quest is quite brash and cartoony. Yeah. But still, um, it's, an, it's a new direction. So it's, it's a it's new how direction. You keep, it's how you keep things fresh after that long. Yeah, it's it's how you keep things fresh. But, I mean, uh, I'm just thinking about it with... Uh, because along with the Dragon Quest uh, twelve apparently being darker, there is uh, Team Ninja, who are working on a uh, Neo-like Final Fantasy spin-off for the PlayStation 5 and PC. A Souls Light game. Uh, this has been leaked. Apparently, all of Square's A3 press conference is leaked, and this is one of the big things which has sort of made it through the noise. Yeah. Um, I'm interested if they make it like Dark Souls Light in the same way that Star Wars Fallen Order was, as in it's yeah. not going to be this difficulty curve, which, as much as the Souls like game f- fans love those games, they're not really broad in their appeal. We've got yeah. a specific audience, and that audience laps it up, but it's not broad in that by any way. Well, I mean, this, if, you, if, if it's light, like Fallen Order is, cool, go for it. I'm interested. Yeah, the, I I agree with you totally on that, and the main reason for that is because one of the things about the Final Fantasy games is that even though some of them are challenging, you know, they're all their main aim is to tell a story. Mm-hmm. They don't make it so difficult that you can't actually finish the game. Um, what I what I'm interested in though is uh, if this is if this 
whole thing signifies Square Enix kind of returning to their roots of telling darker stories, which is how they basically made their name in the first place. And you look at Final Fantasies uh, 4 through to 10, right? All of them are much darker stories than the than the usual uh, fare that you have in RPGs. It was after 10, that they, with uh, 10 Part 2, and then Final Fantasy 12, it kind of lost the way a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the ultimate upshot of this is Square are doing some interesting things. So we're intrigued but, by the, this upcoming direction. Yeah, Final Fantasy 16, the trailer makes it look really dark. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be watching this space quite... Uh, quite closely um again something to do with e3 uh, microsoft and bethesda have set a june date for their e3 adjacent xbox showcase you know the way you worded it there it sounds yeah. like phil and todd have set their date for the big day it's june the 13th it's going to be a big lovely ceremony and all and everybody's friends are going to be invited but you know it's it's, it's cool it's cool and they're going to play the wedding march. Da, 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 <laughs> yeah, which kind of is that, isn't it, really? <laughs> it is. <laughs> but the fact that it's like a 90-minute ceremony. <laughs> um, oh, I can't get that image on my head now. <laughs> it, um, I can't myself. Um, wish my brain never did that. But the fact that it's kind of sum up like two companies that had a, a separate press conferences and put that into one 90 minute block yeah i don't know whether that's good or bad because you know i don't know i don't know i'm still a bit dubious about this relationship between xbox and bethesda and whether it's beneficial to both or whether it's just basically an easy way to get a load of games for xbox. well it's definitely it's definitely the latter it's definitely an easy way to get a load of games so you know todd was the stripper and you know, <laughs> Phil said, will you marry me? I'll get you away from this world. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible is world. It, is this the video game equivalent of leaving Las Vegas? <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> For this metaphor to really come to life, sure, let's, let's do that. <laughs> right, okay, okay. But anyway, okay. short story, you know, this is the press conference where they kind of have to validate this relationship. They have to start validating it because, you know, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And... It's the relationship which is kind of more important than any for uh, Xbox. Yeah. It's interesting, though, that it's not taking place at E3, but adjacent to E3. Well, E3 is kind of irrelevant now anyway, isn't it? So <laughs> it's like Devolver do it in the car park, so, you know. what? <laughs> <laughs> well, Devolver do it anywhere. <laughs> they don't care. Oh, who are they in this relationship? <laughs> oh. The Streetwalker. I think they'd be okay with that, that analogy. They kind of yeah. have that dangerous air about them and devolve so they'll be okay with that. Um, right, you know how every, you know how um, I think it was uh, back at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, people were talking about how Sony have like 10 different things in the works when it comes to movies and TV shows, and they're all based off video games. So there was mm-hmm. The Last of Us stuff and uh, the uh, Uncharted uh, movie and all sorts of things like that. Of course, there's a yeah. Shima movie as well that they're talking yeah. about. Yeah, um, well, kind of, um, Netflix did kind of experiment a little bit with video games. There was the Stranger Things mobile game, and I suppose if you stretch the metaphor quite a lot, you could say Black Mirror Bandersnatch was a kind of game. Yeah, kind of. But Netflix have basically said that they want to do more with interactive entertainment. Now, they haven't actually said whether that is them doing more video game based stuff or whether that's them doing more kind of choose your own adventure tv based stuff just for the sake of this being a video game show i don't know how that's going to work because as far as pure uh ip i don't know whether i netflix have that many to really play with well the reason the the link here is who netflix confirmed it to right because it wasn't uh well basically they confirmed it to gamestop yeah, that's implying games then, isn't it? Yeah, and that uh, that's basically where it's got everybody thinking, hang on, Netflix is going to start doing video games? Yeah, but at the end of the day, they don't have that many IP to work with, and honestly, if they don't work with IP for a company like Netflix to get involved, I don't see where the point is. 
They're not going to start making indie games that have nothing to do with any of their content. I don't yeah. think they're set up as that way for a company. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that they're they're going to launch into video games in a massive way. Speaking of launching into things in a massive way, Rockstar have right. Rockstar partnered with promoter Circo Loco, and they are aiming to support and elevate dance music culture by starting their own record label. I will say one thing: I've always uh, had a great soft spot for Rockstar when it comes to their radio stations. They've always been expertly curated. Yeah, I think GTA Five and GTA. I can't remember GTA Four, but let's just say GTA Five for the sake of this it was excellent. Introduced me to a lot of new bands all well, across the all, spectrum. I, I have to say, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, game franchises, Grand Theft Auto, as a rule, has always had really good radio stations. Yeah. Ever since the first Grand Theft Auto games. Yeah, so the question here, I mean, not question, it's just a little bit disappointing that they're just planting the the flag in electronic music exclusively because they've done so yeah. much or so diff- many different types of music. I, if Rockstar started a radio station, I'd be tuning in. Yeah. Rockstar Radio, and just basically open it up so they play like interesting stuff or have interesting people on expressing interesting opinions. I'd tune in. So, um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's the partnership with Circo Loco that's basically making it, making them focus more on dance music culture, which, yeah. <laughs> I'm not making any comments on that because I'll get in trouble. <laughs> finally, finally, finally. Do you remember J.J. Abrams wanted to make a Portal movie? Yeah, for some reason. Yeah. Uh, well, apparently the Portal movie is now finally on the rails... And they have a script that's being written for the Portal movie now at uh, Warner Brothers. Of all the games to make a movie out of, why Portal? I have no idea. It wasn't, like, Portal 2, as beloved as it is, isn't story-driven, it's character-driven. Yeah. Uh, GLaDOS and whatever the guy, the uh, office guy, can remember his name off the top of my head. Stephen Merchant. Stephen Merchant plays. They were character-driven yeah. moments. Yeah, and narrative they, driven moments. So if you're gonna they, have where they're getting this from, I don't know. Thing is, if you if you're gonna have those characters in the movie, they have to be voiced by Veronica Taylor and Stephen Merchant. Yeah, yeah, they do. They won't know. No, probably maybe, not. Maybe Stephen Merchant. Stephen Merchant might get away with it, but Veronica Taylor probably not. No, I mean, because uh, that's a main role. Yeah, but the question remains: is what's what? Why? And also, the further question remains there, Dan Trachtenberg did a pretty spot-on short film, so if it's not better than that, it kind of made itself redundant. I mean, does J.J. Abrams need a reason to do stuff? No. He just goes and ruins franchises that have been beloved for 40 years. That's his job now. <laughs> uh, he's, uh, I mean, there's, there's, doc- there's Doctor Who, J.J. Do you want to have a crack at that and ruin it for entire generations upon generations of people? I'm I, I'm not, I'm withholding any comment because I know plenty of Whovians and they're already unhappy with the state of Doctor Who as it is right now, and I don't want to get punched. It could always be worse. It could always be JJ'd. <laughs> is that the verb now? <laughs> yeah, because in Community, if you do something badly, you, you breather it. So in the movie, oh terms, yeah, 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 you JJ it when you just completely overcook it. So it could always be JJ. But anyway, yeah, that's the news stories. Let's do some yes. trailer trash, shall we? Um, could have went with all, more, all, all sorts of different directions with this. The obvious one would have been uh, Horizon Forbidden West, but uh, it just looks like more of the same. It looks good. It looks beautiful underwater, but I'm kind of underwhelmed, and it doesn't seem the internet is allowing that opinion. Yeah. I mean, uh, what Rob's referring to is the 14 minutes of apparently gorgeous gameplay on the PlayStation 5. Gorgeous graphics. Yes. Yeah. It looks stunning. But uh, I, I'm looking at it, I'm going, yeah, but, you know, uh, I've done all this already. <laughs> yeah, not having that hook. I mean, the first one, you learn who you are, and I think that's much more interesting than what they could do in this. And it yeah. really told us why we should care, because honestly, with a game that length long, it's the story that really keeps you going. So anyway, that's not trailer of the week. That's not trailer trash, is it? No. Or is uh, it? Uh, n- well, no. I mean, uh, we did we we did want to mention the fact that the trailer is out, and it does. Um, we also want to mention how there are mechanics in the game that, be- well, Breath of the Wild has caused a bit of a storm in third-person action yes. adventure games with that yes. parachute thingy. Every single goddamn game is using it now. Yeah, but instead. Uh, Dying, dying Light 2. Yeah, which uh, 
looks more looks much more interesting and looks like it, right i'm not a big fan of first person games you know this right yeah because you're one of the people who get nauseous because of it yeah yeah motion but Di- dying light is one of the few games where i can actually sit down and play it okay. and i enjoyed the first game but I felt it was lacking in some areas. But the trailer for the trailer for Dying Light Two, the gameplay trailer for Dying Light Two, it's much more interesting. It feel it looks like it's going to be much more dynamic in terms of how um, forces interact with each other. And the one thing which I think is really buried a bit by what you've said there is the fact that this game last year was about it was all signs pointed to lost in development hell, and it just sort of faded away. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I, you get like this, and then they release it, and oh, it's alive! Oh, it's coming out this year! Oh, that's much more interesting than Horizon's gonna Horizon. Yeah, Horizon on the horizon. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to this. It looks interesting. It is another zombie game, but I like the fact that they're putting that sort of uh, the world evolves around your choices and how yeah. successful you are. And that was the thing which made them they like, put it on the back burner because it was a very hard uh, mechanic to really bring to life yeah it's one of those mechanics that um i mean you have to have to make it work you have to have quite literally hours and hours and hours and hours and um, you know tens of thousands of lines of redundant dialogue hours and hours and hours of redundant animation just to make that work yeah and doing that within a pandemic as well doesn't make it the easiest of tasks yeah um when i say redundant i don't mean useless I mean, you have one playthrough, and then the other playthrough might be completely different, so you never experience some things. And then the second playthrough, you might yeah. have a completely different playthrough and experiencing completely different things. And then exactly. the third playthrough, so on and so on and so on and so on. Yeah, exactly. So the you know every playthrough can potentially be you know vastly different to the one before, and that to me it makes it such an interesting game to play. I love games like that where. No matter, you know, every single time you play it, it's always different. Well, as long as you try to do different things, yeah. As long as you try and do different things. I mean, um, that's one of the reasons why I hated the uh, the moral choice system, you know, the uh, black and white morality system that games used to use. You mean infamous as infamous. Black. Yeah, that's a kind <laughs> of a funny word for a franchise, yeah. isn't it? It was an infamous uh, morality system where are you a good guy or are you a bad guy? Choose! And it was the same with Mass Effect. Yeah, and me, I'm an I don't care guy. I just want to be over here, do my own thing. Sliding scale of grey. Yeah. Why are you pestering me with your problems? <laughs> yeah. Um. So that's it for this week's news trash. We'll be back next week, trashing more news. Until next time, if you liked what we did, you like the cut of our jib, there's ways you can support us. The social media links that have been on the page all all the way through this. Uh, as well as a Patreon. Some names of the people who support us on Patreon are on screen now, so if you want to be among them, check on the link and in the description and get involved with some exclusive content over there. But, yeah, thank you for listening all the way to the end. We appreciate each and every one of you beautiful misfits, and we'll see you next week. Bye!